Welcome to the DK Kim Foundation lecture series offered by the Center for Asian Business at Loyola Marymount University in Los Angeles, California. This program is funded by a grant from the DK Kim Foundation in Ontario, California. All right, here's what I want to do. Uh, I, I speak from informal notes, um, but I have uh, a lot to talk about with you today. I'll try to keep it a half an hour or so so that we can have time for, uh, for back and forth. Um, the, you don't need to know, I mean, from any day of watching television or reading the newspaper that the U.S.-China relationship is in great flux now. The landscape is changing uh, very, very rapidly and, and in some cases unpredictably. But let me just give you one example. I have the honor of, uh, uh, w when you reach my stage of life, you, you enter the senior advisor stage. <laughs> so I'm the senior advisor to this and that. And one of the things I'm senior advisor to is the China program of the Carter Center in Atlanta. President Jimmy Carter, as some of you know, uh, was the person who was in the office uh, of the president, who was president and presided over the establishment of normal, full diplomatic relations between the United States and China uh, on the 1st of January, 1979. It was really one of the most distinctive and, and important achievements of President Carter's term in office. And after he left the presidency, he established a wonderful NGO in Atlanta, whose main purposes are really a human service to humanity, you might say, involving uh, all sorts of interesting programs in developing countries, in, in uh, international medical work, and so forth. But because uh, of his personal investment and the, and the association of his name with this fundamental moment in U.S.-China relations, a China program has always existed at the Carter Center. And uh, I happen to be the senior advisor right now. One of the things I do is help the China Center, uh, the China program, I should say, uh, organize bilateral conferences uh, every year in China or in Atlanta. This year, we're going to have a major, major event in Atlanta on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of diplomatic normalization, as the term is called. Uh, and it has fallen to me to recruit the, uh, the American senior figures uh, from scholarship and from, uh, from the world of policy making to write brief papers for this conference. And I, I, these are all friends of mine, and I know them well. And, and so that, that's the easy part. I put a deadline on it of September 30th, and most of the papers are late. And the reason the papers are late is that people are writing to me and saying, well, I know I was just about finished with my paper when something new happened in this complex, changing relationship with China, and I had to stop and revise. So that's a sort of a humble example of the way in which the situation between the U.S. and China is very fluid right now. And even if you, re if, you, uh, if you go out and uh, turn on the news or, or look on your, on your phones tonight at, at developments, even today there have been some new ones. So it is a, uh, it is a changing landscape. The, the reason that Professor Pak invited me here was to talk, or at least to start my talk, uh, by referring to the fact that the United States and China are in a, what is being called a trade war, uh, consisting of reciprocal impositions of tariffs, import taxes, on the products coming into each country from the other country. Tariffs, taxes, tariffs. And uh, as you know, or I think, well, let me just ask for a minute, don't, don't be shy, how many of you have not heard about the reciprocal imposition of tariffs now going on between the U.S. and China. If, you just have, if you're not familiar with it, I'll never know your names. You know, it doesn't matter to me. Just raise your hands. Okay, everybody then has heard something about this. That's, that's an important starting point for me. Um, the uh, the uh, Trump side started it. I'll call it the Trump side. This was not, you know, we could say the U.S. administration, but this is President Trump who, who initiated this. Um, he and his uh, trade advisors uh, decided some time ago that uh, China was engaging in a series of practices, we could call them trade practices, that were so inimical and so damaging to the interests of American companies in China 
and actually to the interest of the United States economy as a whole, that the United States had to take action to bring these bad practices to a halt. And in addition to that, President Trump, uh, who, whose, whose degree is not in uh, higher mathematics, uh, noticed that uh, the uh, United States had a massive merchandise trade deficit with China, not services or anything else, but merchandise trade. The things you can hold in your hands, they sell stuff to us worth more than what we sell to them. And he doesn't like trade deficits. He feels that a trade deficit, by definition, means that we are being ripped off, some would say raped, as he has said, or otherwise abused by whoever has the trade surplus. So he came into office, and even during his campaign, he came into office pledging that he wasn't going to stand for this anymore. He'd had it up to here. He wouldn't stand for it anymore. And last spring, the US Trade Representative's Office, that's the organization of the executive branch that is responsible for trade negotiations with our trade partners, is now led by a gentleman named Ambassador Robert Lighthizer, came out with a, a huge report under a section of American trade law detailing uh, a, a very long list of what were considered to be abusive, abusive practices by the Chinese, including, for example, compelling American high-tech companies to turn over uh, technology secrets to the Chinese, first of all, requiring them to be in joint ventures, in, in minority positions in joint ventures, and then requiring them to turn over uh, high-tech advanced technology secrets, their, their sort of real meat and potatoes, to the Chinese partner as a condition of being allowed to do business in China. That's just one of many. And intellectual property theft and uh, hacking and so forth and so on. It's a very long list. And uh, the Trump administration said, we're not going to tolerate this anymore. And the, 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 uh, the, the path that they chose to follow was to impose punitive tariffs, taxes on things coming into the United States for purposes that have never been absolutely clarified. This is something that drives the Chinese crazy. Uh, is it just to right the imbalance in, in merchandise trade? Or is it to compel the Chinese to stop doing these things like intellectual property theft and these other specific practices laid out in the, in the USGR report? Or is it something bigger still? And the bigger still is uh, that the, the government of China and the, the Communist Party, which dominates the government of China and is more or less synonymous with the government of China, has in the last, I'll talk about this a little further down, but just a quick hint on it now, has embarked on a program of national development over the last uh, five or six years, uh, which is conceived of as taking China into the ranks of and to the forefront of the ranks of the advanced technology nations of the world within a finite period of time, like 2030 or whatever the year is. So the Chinese in their, in their, in their typical manner, because this is the way the Chinese government operates, they laid out a series of plans and goals and targets to get them there and named specific fields. There's a whole list of these advanced technology fields in which uh, they have determined that China must become either a leader of or the leader of world progress in these advanced fields. Well, that needless to say, set the American administration's teeth on edge. And so it, it sometimes seems that the tariffs that make Chinese goods more expensive in the United States and therefore presumably make it, make, them, make it more difficult for Chinese products to be sold in the United States and therefore exert punishment, exert pain, or impose pain on China, are designed not just to write the, the imbalance, you know, the dollar value of the, of the trade going in both directions, uh, and, and, but, but, even, uh, but even to get to the point where the United States is saying, we don't like the way you structure your economy we don't like the way you go about, about this kind of government-led definition of goals and the subsidies that you put into your champion companies to enable them to compete unfairly against American companies in order to reach those. Well, we don't like that. And, the, and what we're going to do to compel you to stop doing that is we're going to tax your goods. Well, the Chinese, as you would expect, said, well, we'll tax your goods, which, of course, they did. And then President Trump said, how dare you retaliate? 
how dare you retaliate against our tariffs by putting tariffs on our goods? We'll tax more of your goods. So by now, uh, we have uh, whatever it is, $300 billion worth of Chinese imports into the United States uh, being taxed with tariffs of 10% that are scheduled to go up to 25% uh, before too very long. And the Chinese have now thrown tariffs on absolutely everything they, buy, they bought last year, if you will, or that they normally buy from us, which is a much lower amount. So it's a tariff war, and, and, and people, people tend to call it a trade war. And that's what Professor Pak invited me here to talk about. Now, now that we've got the baseline, which is we're here to talk about the tariffs, I want to move on, however, to sort of how we got to this and where, it, where it's all going. Because the tariff, the tariff exchange is just a small, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's a big deal, obviously. You know, a lot of companies are feeling the, feeling the pain. The American uh, agricultural exporters, for example, soybean producers, uh, in the American Midwest are feeling the pain. A lot of people are feeling the pain in terms of, of uh, making it more difficult to export to China because of China's tariffs. And as you know, a lot of people uh, who are importing intermediate goods in this country uh, from China, that is things which are brought from China and put into final products made in the United States, parts if you will, they're feeling the pain because those things are more expensive and therefore it makes the cost of production of the final products more expensive. So the, the suffering is there and a lot of people are feeling it, but, but it, it, it's a small, it, relatively speaking, in terms of the larger US-China relationship, it's a small matter, and I want to move into some of these larger issues. We've now had 40 years since normalization. Immediately after, uh, and normalization was, normalization itself, we're just gonna call it that. Remember, it means establishment of full diplomatic relations between the US and China after 30 years of absolutely none. Remember, the communists won the civil war against the nationalists in 1949. The remnant of the nationalist government and army fled to Taiwan where, where they continued to govern in the name of the Republic of China. That was the name of the government which they had had on the mainland from 1927 forward. They fled to Taiwan and the Communist Party established the People's Republic of China in 1949 on the mainland. The United States did not recognize the establishment of the communist government on the mainland in 1949. We maintained our diplomatic relations with the Republic of China on Taiwan, which claimed to be the government of all of China temporarily, temporarily on Taiwan while a rebellion raged on the mainland, but definitely planning to come back to the mainland and resume power at some point in the future. So we stuck with Taiwan, and we, we had no diplomatic relations with the mainland. Moreover, within a year, we were at war with the Chinese in Korea. And that was a, it was a horrible, massive war in which the United States, uh, you know, while it didn't lose, it didn't win. And as you know, the, the end result was an armistice that divided Korea at the 38th parallel. But huge casualties and huge expenses and damage were, were imposed on both the United States and China. So we had no relations from 49 until, uh, until uh, the Nixon breakthrough in 71 and 2. And then we had only this little kind of representative office in Beijing. We didn't have anything like the full, the full diplomatic and economic relations that were established in 79. When they were established, it was a pivotal moment in the history of, of uh, modern China. And we were only a part of it. Mao died in the fall of 76. His radical cohort known as the Gang of Four, some of you have heard of it, uh, fell from power in a coup um, uh, late in 76. Just, a, just almost immediately after Mao died, there was a coup. And uh, in, in beginning in 1977, my first visit to China was January 77. And you should see the photos. <laughs> it's, it's another world. But beginning in 77 and continuing in 78 and then into 79, China went through a, a huge change of direction. Uh, the Chinese called it reform and opening. And beginning in 1978 and moving on with US relations and into the, into the 80s, China began a process of introducing for the first time in decades elements of market economics into the Chinese economy and opening itself to an economic involvement with the larger world outside of the Soviet bloc, that is to say with the, with the larger world 
of the of the uh, of the market economies of the world: the United States, Europe, Japan, and so forth. But it was a colossal change. It's not that everything happened overnight in China, as you can imagine, but the very fact that the policies changed and made things possible uh, was enormously exhilarating. And Americans uh, jumped into it. I won't bore you here with the history of Sino-American relations going into the 19th century and the missionary movement and the boxer, the boxer movement and so forth and so on. We could talk about that later. But there was a kind of a pent-up American desire to re-engage with China. It was partly business driven. You know, I mean, even in, back in the 1920s, there was a guy named Carl Crow who wrote a book called 400 Million Customers. And by the, by the 1980s, that was 800 million. And there were certainly companies, hotel companies and fertilizer companies and all sorts of companies, including aircraft companies who uh, had visions of uh, sugar plums dancing in their heads at the thought of all these people, leaving the fact that they were desperately poor and couldn't afford anything yet. But American business became very interested in China. And at the same time, the United States was eager to engage, remember that word, engage with China, because the, the principal enemy of both the United States and China was the Soviet Union. And Mao and Nixon, and then Mao and Carter, found common ground in the desire to, to form a, a kind of a, a, sort of a united front uh, to, to face what they conceived of, both of them, as the menace of Soviet military power, both on the eastern, uh, eastern side of the world and in Europe. So engagement began. And from, from then until now, the, the, the one term that the United States uses to talk about, about uh, uh, relations with China has been engagement. There is a gentleman living in Los Angeles now named Jeffrey Bader. Some of you will know his name. Jeff was uh, in the uh, National Security Council and was the Asian director under President Clinton. Uh, and um, uh, Jeff uh, is now associated with the Brookings Institution. And he, you, it's B-A-D-E-R. You might look him up online, Jeffrey Bader, and read his, his recent essay just about two weeks ago about engagement. Because what's happening right before our eyes today is that engagement, this overarching idea that the United States and China should engage, should, should build relations and ties and connections and cooperations with each other under the rubric of engagement, that concept is now under fundamental uh, assault and is actually, one might say, uh, being consigned to the, to the uh, historical trash bin. Jeff Bader uh, published an article for Brookings about two weeks ago defending the idea of engagement, enunciating all the ways in which engagement over the last 40 years has been good for us and good for China, and arguing that the whole idea of engaging with, the United, with China uh, on issues of bilateral interest, but also on issues of global interest, really is important and should not be discarded. The rules-based international order, that's another term Americans like to use, and understandably so. China, it was really very moving to, to watch China in, uh, in the late 70s as they escaped beyond uh, the Maoist era. Uh, there was a speech, how many of you have heard of Deng Xiaoping? Hands, please. Who's heard of Deng Xiaoping? Okay, how many people have not heard of Deng Xiaoping? Hands, please. Okay, that's, that's important for me to, to, to understand. Uh, I'm going to, we don't have a chalkboard here. D-E-N-G, Deng. X-I-A-O-P-I-N-G, Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping was the Chinese Communist Party leader who emerged as the top guy in China after the fall of Mao. There was a little interregnum for a little while there, but basically by 1978, Deng had emerged from disgrace and from being sent out to the countryside to shovel pig manure and so forth during the Cultural Revolution and had become the leader of, uh, of uh, China all over again. And right at this crucial minute when things were changing in China, he gave a speech to a science conference in China. You know, during the Cultural Revolution, people with education, people with college education, for example, were were in terrible, were treated really, really badly. They were denounced as, uh, as uh, highfalutin uh, 
political enemies. They were sent out to the countryside, uh, it, and many, some of them were killed. Many of them were disgraced. It was really a terrible period for people of education. Dung went to the National Science Conference, and these poor bedraggled scientists came back from their disgrace and from their poverty and from the loss of their reputations and the destruction of their careers. And they came together at this meeting, and Dung said, uh, China has a great deal to be proud of in its, in, its, in its contributions to the world heritage of science. And he named the four great inventions. Chen Dung, what are the four great inventions? Printing. The compass. Paper. Gunpowder. We can be proud of our contributions, and we, we can take great pride from these historic contributions we've made. For example, the four great inventions, that's the term in Chinese. But here's where it got powerful. Dung said, but science is a, is a world heritage. And we Chinese, we need not only to contribute to it, but we need to draw from it. Now, for these scientists and technical people who for the last 20 years, if, they'd, if they had made the mistake of subscribing to the Journal of the American Medical Association, they would have been denounced as traitors. If they'd, if they'd, if they'd bought popular mechanics, they would have been denounced as traitors because they were reading capitalist literature. For them, the message was, China is rejoining the world, the world stream of scientific discovery and, 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 uh, and the flow of ideas. And, and so at that moment, when Deng made announcements like that at the end of 78, just when we normalized, it meant that China had decided to re-enter the mainstream. And leaving aside the intellectual world for a minute, what the mainstream meant in economic terms was a whole system of global economic and commercial behavior that China, for the last 30 years, it had nothing to do with, and for the most part, knew nothing about. You know, in, in, in the late 70s, Victor Lee, who was then teaching at, the Stan at Stanford in the law school, wrote a book called Law Without Lawyers, because in the Cultural Revolution, China had no lawyers. There was, there was no body of law. Now China was setting out to rejoin the world. How do you do business with the world if you don't have law? They passed a joint venture law in 1979. That was the beginning. But they didn't have any lawyers. They didn't have any judges. They didn't have any courts. The point was that China then set out to join the rules-based international order, another term Americans use all the time. And what that meant as time passed in the 80s and into the 90s and, and even all the way to, to 2001 was that China became a part of a set of institutions global institutions, global economic institutions, whose origins lay in, uh, in work done at the end of World War II, mainly by the Americans. Who, who knows what some of those institutions were? Any, anybody know? The World Bank, number one. The International Monetary Fund. And the third of the tripod was then called the GATT, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. Those three were created at a conference in New Hampshire in 1944 in the effort, led by the United States but with its wartime allies, in the effort to prevent from reoccurring the economic catastrophes of the 1930s, which had led to, in, in their view, had led to the collapse of economies and the rise of fascism and totalitarianism and ultimately to World War II itself. Now, here was China coming from Mars, you know, from Venus, from Saturn, uh, and, uh, and, with, and had to go through the process of acquainting itself with this rules-based international order. And it made very, very strong efforts to do that. As it did it, uh, the Chinese set out to, be, to, to benefit from this rules-based global economy. And they created uh, what, what they had in the 80s, what they had was a vast, impoverished labor pool. They had hundreds of millions of people living in agriculture whose marginal productivity was zero 
some of you, that's about as far as I can get on economics, but I do know what marginal productivity means. The marginal productivity was zero. The, added, the, the addition of one more laborer to that piece of land made absolutely no difference to what was produced on that land. They, they were surplus labor. And what the Chinese began to discover in the 80s and moved very quickly to maximize was the use of that very poor pool of labor for low-end production of goods which, uh, which they could produce and sell to the world and earn foreign exchange with which to buy the things they couldn't produce. So you saw in the 80s the rise of the Chinese uh, uh, labor-intensive manufacturing sector, clothing, shoes, toys, luggage, and so forth. And gradually, uh, as time went on, the Chinese began to, to move into low-tech manufacturing of, of, uh, of equipment, you might say, low-tech electronic G-jaws and so forth. What emerged from all of that was what, you, what we saw by the, by the late 90s and the early, 20, early 2000s, and that was China as the factory to the world. The Chinese, they did a hell of a job. They, they, they created the infrastructure, the ports and the highways, the transportation systems within China to maximize China's success in the global economy, building primarily on their labor resources, above all on their labor resources. They were short on capital, they were short on management skills. They were short on technology. They looked to the West and particularly to the United States for that. What they had was labor. And thus, uh, China became uh, a very significant player, an, an export machine of, of greater and greater salience in the world economy. Now, joining the rules-based international order was not something they could do overnight. And they, even when they joined the WTO in 2001, the process of accommodating themselves to the pre-existing system, which they had no role in designing, after all. They had nothing to do with creating these things. It was, it was a slow process of training and, and adjustments. Um, but they've done, a, they've done a pretty good job. And along the way, they've learned, in, in many, they've learned to game the system. They have learned, and the United States takes great umbrage at this, and understandably so, they have learned in some cases to honor the, the, the letter but not the spirit, or in other ways to maximize their own interests while, while not, necessarily, uh, not necessarily playing the rules-based game the way the designers of the game expected it to be played. And that's where the frictions uh, arise. Now, a lot of the hostility today then uh, with regard to China is, is, is about the allegation that China is attempting both economically uh, and militarily, as in the case of the conflicts that, are, that seem so, so close at hand in the South China Sea and along the, the oceans, the, along the saltwater on, on China's eastern periphery. Uh, the, 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 uh, a lot of American critics who look at China with great alarm uh, see this as China uh, changing, uh, attempting to change the status quo. You hear a lot about that. We've, we've already talked about the rules-based order. Sorry, that was me adjusting my tie and whacking my microphone. Um, we've heard about the rules-based order, but another term that comes up a lot is uh, China's attempts to alter the status quo. I think Americans have to be really cautious about that. I mean, the reality is, to me, that the very fact that a country of 800 million, now a billion, 300 million, a country of 800 million people decided to open its doors to foreign investment, which was a big part of what the opening was about, and to participate in the world economy, pretty much on the world economy's terms, that was a change of the status quo. We all thought it was a good idea. But let's, let's get rid of the idea that there's some sort of make America great moment. Pardon me. Did I say that? <laughs> Take it back. Some sort of status quo moment, some sort of ideal state then that, that, that is sort of frozen in time that China is seeking to undo or to, to, to uh, upset. Of course, <coughs> status quo's stati quo don't work like that. At least they don't work like that in international relations and international economics. It's constantly changing. Uh, and, and Americans need to disabuse themselves of the idea that there was this sort of wonderful moment, this status quo. The status quo that most people have in mind, by the way, if I may be so bold, 
is the status quo of September 1945, when the Japanese surrendered and Germany was in ruins, Japan was in ruins, Italy was insignificant, and, there, and Britain had been exhausted by the war, France had been occupied and was without power, most of, most of Europe otherwise had been devastated by the war and was in political disarray. And the United States emerged from World War II, granted, I mean, and it's not a small matter, we lost 400,000 killed, and a great many more people suffered a great deal. But compared to the rest of the world, the United States was essentially unscathed. And militarily and economically, there was no one anywhere close to us. And, and that, uh, what, what a lot of the American debate now is about has to do with with a kind of nostalgic vision of returning to some form of that American moment of predominance, uh, which uh, frankly, uh, I think many, many observers, including me, find uh, that it would be inconceivable to return to because there are just too many countries out there who have recovered, long since recovered economically and politically, and in many cases who are able to do what we can do, and in some cases to do it cheaper. But um, it, it's, it's, been a, it's been a long process and it leaves America very unsettled today. I'll, I'll move quickly now. When the Chinese got to, the Chinese political system evolved and didn't evolve. And by 2012, when a new uh, a leadership was about to be named, uh, a lot of people in China, practically everybody you talk to, said uh, our system as we have run it so far uh, has, has run out of steam. It's run out of gas. We, we can't go on this way. We've, by 2012, you know, it was, China was a huge economy. It was a huge player on the world scene. It had uh, very substantial military power, et cetera. But the feeling was that the system had sort of exhausted itself. Interest groups, Li Yi Jituan, interest groups, were taking over the society. They were more powerful than the government and the party itself. The petroleum group, the chemical group, these were, these were sort of conglomerate economic groups with their own interests which, which were being put ahead of the interests of the country as a whole. So there was a great deal of concern about the political system being taken over by interest groups. Pollution was then and still is but was already then uh, a disaster. I mean, the, 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 the water resources of China that are now polluted and undrinkable, we could go on and on. And you've all seen pictures of the Beijing smog. How many of you have been in a real honest-to-God Beijing smog? It's, it's, it's just indescribable. It's, so, and by, by, by 2012, there were, there were a lot of people in the middle class. There were people who had made money. There were people with disposable income. There were people who cared about lifestyle. This was no longer peasants earning $60 a year, you know, struggling to survive. There were a lot of people who had been in the outside world. They'd been all over the world. They knew they could watch television, and they knew that there were better ways to live than what they were looking at in terms of the environment in which they were living. And finally, the, the Gini coefficient problem was on everybody's tongue. The inequality, the gap between the, the wealthy and the poor, the, the small, I call it the 1% for lack of a better term, and the, and, the, and the rest of the society, but especially the poor, was getting bigger and bigger and was really larger than that found in almost any country in the world. So by 2012, there was a feeling the system really was in crisis. And friends of mine in, China, in the Chinese government were just as frank about that as, uh, as people uh, who, were, who were not friendly to the Chinese government. Xi Jinping came in. Everybody said, he's going to be a reformer. He's going to be a reformer because he, you know, he's... he's, he's He's, he's got the right credentials. He's going to reform things and open up the market economy more and so forth. Dun, dun. And uh, he formed it. He, I think, I mean, I, one of the things you should never do with China is put thoughts in other people's heads. I'm not going to say Xi Jinping thought. It, you know, don't go there. A lot of people do that all the time. Journalists do it a lot. It seems as though he responded to the widespread uneasiness as to the future of the whole system uh, by some fundamental decisions. One, he created this notion of the China dream, the Zhongguo Meng, which was propagandized to the whole country. This idea that there is a kind of a, an aspirational dream that all people, all people in China 
should share in aspiring to and working toward. He, was, he's, he has attempted to create, if you will, an ideological theme song for the whole country to rally around and employ the very gigantic uh, apparatus of the Chinese Communist Party's propaganda system and media system to, to encourage everybody to, to, uh, to adopt the ideals of the China dream. In that China dream, Xi, more than his predecessors, although everybody's always said it, he, he's really acted on it, has emphasized that the Communist Party itself, 90 million people in the Communist Party, is absolutely primary, absolutely primary in every walk of life, in everything you do, in higher education, in agriculture, it doesn't matter what. The party leads, and what the party says is the truth, is the truth, and everybody needs to understand that. There's a certain cult of Xi Jinping that has developed himself. You see posters of Xi everywhere, and, uh, and, and the, his, his leadership has been personalized to a degree that makes some people in China very uneasy because it looks like a kind of Mao Zedong style uh, 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 cult of personality again. He embarked on an anti-corruption campaign which has endeared his regime to many people in China because corruption, one of the other things in 2012 that everybody said was completely out of control and was gonna bring the whole society down, a corruption uh, was so rampant, and basically if you wanted to get anything done that required government approval, you had to bribe at any level, down to the village, up to the top, over and over again. Uh, Xi Jinping set out to go after corruption in a big way, and hundreds of thousands of people have been arrested, and, uh, and uh, that campaign has continued to this day. But it also involved a crackdown uh, on, on the Chinese intelligentsia, the educated people, the students, and, and, the, and the people in universities and in the, in, the, in, the, in the walks of life that required higher levels of education and the internet and the media. And the, the, if you will, the repressiveness of the regime in the name of stability and national security on those fronts has been very, very pronounced. There's just no getting around it. I mean, we can all sort of say, well, you know, these things happen, but it's, it's very consistent. And to Americans, of course, it is, most Americans find it a very repellent. And then finally, uh, under, this, under this leadership of uh, Xi Jinping, um, the, uh, the government and the party have embarked on an even more stringent so-called anti-terrorism policy aimed primarily at the great land masses of inner Asia that are part of the People's Republic of China, namely Tibet and the Mongol, the, the, uh, the Uyghur and Muslim areas known as Xinjiang. Huge, huge areas of land with not very many people in them, but politically very, very sensitive. There's been a lot of, a, a lot of uh, very tough repression aimed ostensibly at anti-terrorism uh, there. So all of this has given the Americans a lot to worry about. And we're not even talking about the military, the military issues in the South China Sea. President Trump's The arrival of President Trump uh, represented uh, a, a pledge of a change of direction from what had come uh, before him under successive presidents, Republican and Democratic alike. Um, I once told the minister of embassy in Washington, D.C., the number two guy in the embassy in Washington, D.C. years ago, that the United States and China would never go to war because the United States was too important to China and China was too unimportant to the United States. Well, he looked at me as though I was crazy. I mean, he, and, and I said, no, let me tell you what I mean. What I mean is that for, for, the, for the American people, China is just too far away. It's just too far away. The American people are not going to commit to a limitless, boundless expenditure of America's, America's resources in an existential conflict with China, the way they did in 1945 and 46 and 47 and 48 with the Soviet Union. It's just, you know, the, Soviet, the Soviets were there in Europe taking over Europe, America responded, and we got into a Cold War that was enormously expensive, but that was very, really largely supported in the United States for the next, for the next 40 years. That's not gonna happen, quoth I, with China, because for most people, China's just out there, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, I once ran into Robert Rubin, the Secretary of the Treasury, 
on an airplane, and I said, are you going to the APEC meetings this year in Jakarta? And he said, yeah, I'm going, but you know it's so damn far. <laughs> far, I mean, Secretary Rubin. So that's what I told this, this minister then. I'm not so sure I would tell him that today. I'm not so sure that that kind of placid confidence that China was a sort of distant Asian something out there, even, even, even and certainly, it's partly, a coast, it's partly an American geographic issue. Asia is farther from America on the East Coast than it is out here. And I say that as somebody born and raised and educated on the East Coast with all that Anglophilia and all that European stuff, but having transferred to the West Coast long ago. China, Asia feels more real even now, I think, if you live in California, Oregon, and Washington than it does in, you know, this is an overgeneralization, but it's just a different meaning when you're on the Pacific side of the, of the United States. But overall now, it seems to me that China has entered the American consciousness to a degree that I had not expected it to in the past. And President Trump is certainly, and, and the Trump approach to China is a part of that. I, I, and, that and that's why these, these tariff issues are part of something larger in which the whole concept of engagement uh, is, is being uh, heavily criticized and even, I think, discarded. I think, uh, um, but I think at the end of the day, the, the, the real problems that we face, the biggest problems that we face, how should I put it? We're interdependent, you've all heard that term. We, it's not just, you know, where, where you, who makes your socks? It's not that. It has to do with the fact that China is a huge purchaser of American bonds. China funds the US government. We spend, the government spends vastly more than it takes in. Our deficits grow, our indebtedness grows. We fund the government by selling sec treasury securities and China buys, has been buying them for decades now in gigantic quantities. We owe the Chinese a great deal of money, but in the meantime, China's purchases have meant that the United States could go on living the life we like to lead with the Lincoln Navigators and the Cadillac Escalades in, in, you know, in, in, in my town on coastal Washington State, these 60-foot long campers with the pop-outs and the, I mean, you know, it's all part of the deal, part of the drill. And, and uh, to the extent that we're living beyond our means year after year, including thanks now to another gigantic tax cut uh, and increases in our budget year after year without any end in sight or even any slowing of the, of the, of the increase in debt in sight. The Chinese have been, uh, in a sense, by, by their purchases, which they've made for their own reasons, uh, they have been helping us to, uh, to, uh, to forestall inevitable problems. Ultimately, that is the biggest thing I think the United States faces, and we seem politically incapable of discussing it at all. That is how we are going to get America's national financial balance even, even starting to be restored again. The second problem is political dysfunction. Uh, it is true that today, in addition to the tariff issue, that Republicans and Democrats are pretty much of one mind or seem to be about China. You see organized labor, for example, which is a Democratic constituency. You see organized labor perfectly happy to see those tariffs go up on Chinese goods because organized labor has always been, always been opposed to American trade agreements with China for fear that American companies would put their investments in China and invest in production in China because the labor was cheaper and, uh, to, and take production out of, out of the United States, as we've seen in the Midwest and, and in so many areas of the, of, of the uh, especially, well, in, in the American manufacturing sector. So political dysfunction, as we see every day in the papers, and as we've seen in the last few weeks, is, is, is a real factor, not so much on, uh, in terms of, of the specifics of the tariff issue, but in terms of foreign policy more generally. And, and the fact that this particular administration has essentially, as I see it, declared, uh, uh, well, war is a strong word, has, has decided to, to, to walk away from the policy of multilateralism, walk away from the climate change agreement, walk away from the Trans-Pacific Partnership, concentrate on bilateral agreements with individual countries, and on protectionism, as it's seen in the case of not only the tariffs on China, but uh, the steel, steel and aluminum tariffs 
on our friends on, on Mexico and Japan and Canada and so forth. The fact that this administration has turned to a much more unilateral and really anti-multilateral approach to the world is not, I think, going to be forever. And, and so the, the, future of American, the future of American policy toward America's role in the world is, is, not, is not set in stone as you see it today. Um, in other words, the my, way of the my way or the highway notion may or may not have long legs. I, I think the jury is still out on that. On China, at the same time, and this is an area where, again, in this media onslaught, which is just, just vast now, the tariff matter is just a small part of it. In this, in this daily media onslaught about the dangers coming out of China now, one of the things that we have to be, we have to kind of reserve a little sort of 10% part of our brains for is that we shouldn't fall into the belief that what we see in China today is going to happen, is going to continue in a linear fashion into the future. And some of the, some of the things I laid on you that the Xi Jinping administration has been doing in China over the last five or six or seven years, many of them of concern to the United States, the beating about hostile Western forces, the constant hammering at the dangers posed by hostile Western forces, which means us, et cetera, et cetera. I, I may be uh, foolishly optimistic on this, or at least foolishly agnostic, but I think it's premature to look at today's China and say, that's the way it's going to be. This is not me giving a Nazi salute. This is me describing a linear pattern of development. Um, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's foolish to say, we're looking at China today, and that's what we're going to see in the future. Because the past, at least, it says otherwise. I mean, who would have known in the spring of 1976 what was going to happen in China in terms of its complete reordering of its political priorities within the next 18 or, 20, 18 or 24 months? And, and similarly, even, even, after the, even after the Cultural Revolution ended, we've seen real zigs and zags in Chinese uh, policy, domestic policy and economic policy, for example. Today, right now, today, I mean, go, go out and look at it. There is a very significant discussion going on in China about the role of the private sector in the Chinese economy. The, China, the private sector provides now, in, in this economy, not the 1977 economy, but today's economy, 90% of the new employment in China comes, comes out of non-governmental companies, many of them little, startups, moms and pops, some of them get, get like, like Alibaba, get to be, of course, enormous. And the dynamism in the economy clearly is coming not from the great state-owned enterprises, which, which the state subsidizes and keeps afloat, but from private sector economies. But there are people in China today saying the day of the private sector is over. We need to move back toward the classic Marxist, Leninist, socialist state in which the the, the state-owned state enterprises are, are not just the core, but are, the, are pretty much the sum total of the Chinese economy. My point is, big debates go on in China. There are people of lots of different views in China. Americans, right now, because of, the, of this media thing that we're, we're exposed to, and I, I'm not saying that the media is telling us phony stories. I'm just worried about the, the kind of totality of the tidal wave of it. Uh, we, we might get the impression that everybody in China, like we did in the 1950s and 60s, everybody in China thinks the same way. Well, of course, you know, those of you who have been to China and taken a look around, you know better. And if you're going to go on Professor Park's uh, two classes that are going to get, get you over to East Asia, or one of them is going to get you to China, you'll see it for yourselves. Of course people think different thoughts in China. Of course people have different views. Of course people have private lives. So we, we've got to not let ourselves get so swept away Again, the tariffs are just a kind of a, a kind of a, a minuscule example of this. We mustn't let ourselves as a nation get swept away with the idea that we are involved in an irreversible downward spiral uh, uh, against which no, which is written in stone, which is which is foreordained, and uh, and is, is 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 defined by the fact that China is going to go on exactly the same course as now now on forever. I feel very very strongly about that. I will be criticized, I might say, for saying things like that by people who, who have other views for uh, being, 
well, what's a good word? I'm going to stop on this. But for being almost complicit, complicit in perpetrating, in perpetrating the the uh, the malign behaviors uh, that are now characteristic of the People's Republic of China. A lot of Americans are saying, well, if you don't see China the way we see it, you must be some sort of apologist for China, which of course is nonsense. And and in the American community of people who study China, there is a great deal of different different view on that. But the but the there's a lot for the Americans to be concerned about, a great deal. And China has a lot to be, is responsible for a lot. It, it needs to be held to account for a great deal, including in the area of economics and business behavior. There's no question about it. But to, to, to believe that uh, this regime, at this moment in its existence, is set on a path of, of uh, irreversible, and increasingly uh, uh, uncontestable authoritarianism or totalitarianism with all the implications that that has for the future of Sino-US relations, including our trade relations, I think is at, at the very least premature. Now, if you, I'm gonna stop on this, but just to say this, you know, most of you have not been studying China for the last 50 years or 20 years or 10 years or one year fine, but I urge you, I really urge you, not only to vote, please vote. If you're over 16 or whatever the California age is, vote. That could, you can vote for whomever you want, please vote. But get involved with cyber, get involved with the, with the Center for International Business Education and Research here, which Professor Pak and, and, uh, and, uh, Ma, and, and, and uh, Markey have, have succeeded in bringing to this, this university. It's a great grant, a great possibility for those of you who are students here. Get involved with it. Take the Asia courses. If you can, do some language. I, I don't mean to say China is something you do some of. It's a big, tough language. It takes a long time. A year won't, won't do squat for you. But, but dip, your feet, dip your toes into it anyway. Do a first year Chinese language. See, see, what, see what it challenges you to do and learn. And, and, uh, and don't do it because you know that the minute you get out, with your, B, your BA or your, or your MBA in, uh, from LMU that you're gonna have an $800,000 job waiting for you because you took Chinese one at, at Loyola Marymount, do it because it's really stimulating and interesting and important to the United States and to your country. There's just so much out there that we need young people to be injecting themselves into. Uh, you know, it is a changing status quo. The memories that I have of, of when I started studying uh, East Asia and China, going back to the 1960s, those will not be the memories even of your teachers, let alone of you yourselves who are students. And, and, and there has to be that constant flow of new blood and new ideas into the American relationship with Asia, commercially, business-wise, but also more broadly, socially, culturally. And, uh, and those of you who are at, LM, at uh, Loyola Marymount, now, especially with the opportunity of the new cyber, you have an opportunity to, to poke in and see what it's like. Please, please do it. Thank you, I've talked too long. I don't even want to think about my wristwatch, but there's time for at least a few questions, I hope. Thanks. The Nixon opening in 71 and 72, which was of course the dazzling surprise that was dropped on the United States after Kissinger's secret trip and then the Nixon trip, that was very heavily strategic. <coughs> that was because we were locked in the Vietnam War. We needed help getting out of there. The Chinese were supplying the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese. Uh, and at the same time, we were in the worst stages of the Cold War with the Soviets. And the Chinese had begun, you know, the, I think you know well, some of our friends here may not. The Soviets helped the Chinese communists win the Civil War in 1949. The Soviets had a, a, a basic principle of communist internationalism going back to their fun, most fundamental doctrines. And, and for the Soviets, the Chinese Communist Party was a sort of a, a, sort of a junior partner uh, a junior member of this, what they hoped would be this global 
global uh, movement of communist parties coming to power all over the world. So they helped with arms and other things. They helped the, the communists beat the nationalists in the Civil War. But within seven years, that had all come to, a, to a, an ugly end. Stalin died, Khrushchev took over. Khrushchev made a speech denouncing Stalin. Mao Zedong was horrified uh, at the betrayal of what he perceived to be the betrayal of communism by Khrushchev. Uh, and before you know it, lickety split within about the next five years, the Sino-Soviet relationship, what we used to call the Sino-Soviet bloc, B-L-O-C, uh, had fallen apart. And, and by the late 1960s, the, the Chinese and the Russians were actually having military conflicts along the borderline in Manchuria, along the Amur River, in, in the farthest northeast frontier of China, bordering Siberia. Well, Nixon looked around at this, and to his credit, I mean, you know, he, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs in 1967 saying, you know, we can't go on forever pretending the Chinese don't exist. And, uh, and he acted on it secretly with Kissinger because he saw this as a, essentially a geostrategic opportunity. And for reasons of their own, uh, the Chinese under Mao Zedong, deep in the Cultural Revolution, did the same. Because they were, they were, of course, afraid, you know, Mao was afraid the Russians were going to start atomic bombing China. They, they, he, was, he was very worried that, that war, horrible war was going to break out between China and the Soviet Union. So it was all strategic at the very beginning. But I got to tell you, I mean, the US-China Business Council, which I used to lead, if you can call it that, um, uh, was founded in 1973 as the National Council for US-China Trade. And uh, if you, I, I recently, because I'm writing an essay on this evolution of all of this, I recently got a copy of the original board of directors from the National Council for US-China Trade, 1973. And you know, I mean, it's Citibank, and John Deere, and a lot, I mean, some of the names you wouldn't recognize the name, a lot of them were big companies, the kinds of companies that even then, when there was nothing going on, took the long view and said, you know, there's 800 million people there, and, uh, and, and so it, from the beginning, it, it had that commercial element. It began, oddly enough, with hotels. You can still go to the Jenguo Hotel, right on the main drag, uh, on, on Jenguo Manwai Dajie, and uh, there's the Jenguo Hotel, which was, which was the first joint venture hotel in China by an American guy named C.B. Sung and whoever the Chinese partner was. And they made this funny looking little sort of three story, little campus like little hotel. And at the time it was absolutely revolutionary. There's nothing like it. I still stay there. I love the Jenguo. <laughs> I mean, everybody laughs at me now because it's so old fashioned. But the point was, there was interest from the beginning. And as soon as Diplomatic, this is where diplomatic relations really made the difference. When we established diplomatic relations in 79, then came the first US-China economic agreement, 1980, which laid down the fundamental bases on which American companies and Chinese would be business people as well, could start to rationally plan for the development of business between the two sides. It remained slow and Chinese, poli Chinese policies were slow to evolve. I mean, it's not that in 1980 and 81, suddenly everybody in China just loved foreign investment. I mean, there, there was a great deal of leftover fear and kind of Stalinist reaction against the kinds of pollutions that they thought capitalism represented. But things changed, and by the late 1980s and into the 90s, well, I should say, by the early 90s, because of course something happened in 1989 that momentarily put the kibosh on everything, and that was the, the tragedy of Tiananmen. When, when, uh, when Deng Xiaoping himself called out the army to suppress the hunger strikers and the demonstrators in, in Beijing in uh, June of 1989, it was so horrifying to uh, the world, and certainly to many, most of us in America, uh, relations almost ground to a halt, and a lot of American companies headed out. I mean, first they had to evacuate their people because there was physical danger, so it was like the 1920s all over again. They had to suddenly manage to get their people to the airport safely and then get them on the first plane out of, out of the country. But even beyond that, 
the, the reaction in China, among, among the political leadership in China, to what had happened in the first couple of years was profoundly conservative. It was, it was shut the doors. It was like a sea urchin just closing like this. Everything shut down. It was all suppression, repression, no more of this outside world you know, stuff. And a lot of American companies uh, headed out. The US China Business Council, which I came to in 1994, uh, had uh, two years before that had been right on the edge. I, I remember the letter from our general counsel of talking about the orderly wrapping up of its affairs. The membership in the business council had just gone through the floor and the council as an organization was at the edge of extinction. But, 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 it became an internal political battle between Deng Xiaoping and some of these old line sort of Stalinist political warriors who had come back into power in the face of the Tiananmen disturbances. And in, as you all know, or many of you know, in 1992, Deng, who was really out of power, he was sort of in seclusion, but still had this aura about him because he was a senior people. You know, he, he had, he had a, an aura that could not be destroyed. Deng made a trip to the south and he went to Shenzhen. How many of you have been to Shenzhen there? A few of you left in the room. Shenzhen is a, was a fishing village just across the border from Hong Kong. But, but Deng Xiaoping had, had, uh, had pre presided over the turning of Shenzhen into China's first special economic zone where foreign companies could come in and invest and they would be able to conduct their business activities inside the bubble of the special economic zone and it was almost like extraterritoriality. They were, they were not subject to the same political and political legal restraints that they would be in the rest of China. Well, Shenzhen had done very well and a lot of foreign companies went in there for their labor intensive manufacturing and, and peasants flowed into the city and got jobs and exports boomed and, uh, and Shenzhen became the first of uh, uh, later, uh, the first of, of what ultimately amounted to several dozen of these special economic zones in the 1980s before the Tiananmen crisis. So in 1992, Deng went down to Shenzhen and he made a speech which essentially turned things around. He basically said market economy reforms full speed ahead and, uh, and the, the reform process, the opening and reform regained the initiative and took off then at a huge rate. So my timing was exquisite. My timing was perfect. My predecessor had had to live through the, through the, through 19, well, in, in 89 when, when, the, when the, the Communist Party is destroyed the demonstrators, uh, my, my predecessor too before me actually quit the business council. He said, I'm not gonna, I'm not going to, he was a retired foreign service officer, had a lot of China background. He said, I'm not gonna serve and have anything to do with these people. I'm, I'm out of here, don't. And it, it, he, he felt very, very strongly about it. He was succeeded by my immediate predecessor, another retired foreign service officer who had served in China. And that poor guy had to live through the, through the, the collapse of the business involvement in China uh, and uh, the near collapse of the organization that he was responsible for. So I got there at, at a, I got there just when things were starting to pick up again. So I mean, my board of directors loved me because membership grew like membership grew like mad. I mean, I have a sort of outgoing personality anyway, but I was out there. I was out there growing the membership like there's no tomorrow, and uh, the council's finances were booming. And boy, that cap's doing a great job. Look at those finances, you know. But it was all timing, because in fact, Deng had said, "Back to reform, back to engagement with the world, back to foreign investment coming into the country. Let's go for it," and that began. Uh, the, the period that was really the, uh, the period in which the economic dimensions of the U.S. relationship uh, with China really became uh, the, the, the overwhelmingly um, central relationship. From then until about three years ago, and I'm, I'm gonna call on you, from then until about three years ago, it was always said, and I mean, I lived through it, I was part of it, that the business community in the United States was the ballast, the, the heavy, solid, stable base at the base of this relationship. Some people said the American business community was, you know, was 
too nice to China or tried to be, you know, tried to make China like them too much. But nevertheless, when it came to political battles in the United States about relations with China, business said, we need, there is great opportunity there for business, for our country, for our companies, for our country, for world peace. We need a stable and predictable relationship between the United States and China. And we worked hard at that. In, in my case, it was getting, getting, getting the legislation passed as China entered the WTO. In the last four or five years, some, a little longer than that, some people would say, a lot of people say, Bob, boy, you sure left Washington right at the right time. Uh, the, the business community's commitment to that kind of to making sure that the United States and China did not become alienated from one another, that business consensus has, to a very significant degree, collapsed. Because American businesses have found that they have been crudely, badly treated in China. A classic case, uh, they, can't, they can't participate in, in uh, the cloud in China. But also the endless cases about technology theft and the endless cases of, 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 of subsidization of their Chinese champion counterparts, the, the, the big Chinese uh, development plans which make it absolutely crystal clear that they're aimed at discriminating between Chinese entities and outside entities. And American, a lot of American business has become quite disenchanted and they've made that clear to Mr. Lighthizer and to others in the American government. Not all. If you're a soybean, you know, if you're, I'll use, I guess I won't use any company names in case somebody is recording. But if you're a great agribusiness company, you're, you know, there's a lot at stake with China. The, you know, you've got, you, you might have 30 or 40 feed mills producing animal feed in China, using soybeans that are shipped from Minnesota or from, or from, uh, or from Kansas, where, wherever the soybeans are coming from or from Brazil because you trade in soybeans on the global market. And you know, you've, got, you've got a lot going on in China and, it, and you're not suffering the same way that some of the American tech firms are suffering. So the business community has fragmented uh, in terms of the way they're treated. And the best evidence of this, if those of you who are on the faculty, just go to the websites of the US China Business Council, uschina.org, or the American Chamber of Commerce in China or the American Chamber of Commerce in Shanghai, all of which do member surveys every year, and they're really interesting, and you should look at them. They've got great graphics, and you'll see the way the experiences now have, 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 uh, have become much more diverse, and the consensus, the political consensus in the United States is not what it used to be. Yes, ma'am. You know, in the old days when you met somebody from China, the first thing the person from China would say to you is, China is a big country. Well, yes, it is. And, and uh, everybody on China's periphery knows that. And they knew it even before China got rich and powerful, but now they really know it. And the trade relationship between virtually any country in Asia and China is the biggest trade relationship for each of those countries, bigger than us. We, we have a certain confidence that our market is always going to be the biggest market for the Philippines or Indonesia or Singapore. It's no longer true because, in fact, most of these countries have uh, the, most, the largest single tra trading relationship they have now is with China. So on the one hand, they want to get along with China, but on the other hand, uh, they feel the weight of China, and China doesn't do much to, uh, to uh, prevent that. I mean, when Yang Jiechi, who is now the state councilor, state councilor, vice premier, when Yang Jiechi, whom I know, I knew quite well actually, when Yang Jiechi says to some Southeast Asian, well, what country was it? He basically says, "China is a big country, and you're a small country, and you just have to recognize that." That that's not the kind of talk that endears small countries to a big country, even though the United States has pretty much said the same thing on more than one occasion over the last 60 years. So there is uneasiness around China's periphery. To say nothing of India, which has a billion plus people, and it's in fact gonna have more people than China in another 20 years, and has a very significant military, and has a very complex border with China, and has, 
complex relationships with many of the states in the so-called Indo-Pacific region as well. So the question this young lady asked is, when, when the countries around China's periphery begin to get together to, if not oppose China, at least somewhat resist China's coercive power, what, what does that all come down to? Well, the United States acts like it would like nothing better than to have all those countries come running back to Uncle Sam or, or, or Madame Uncle Sam and get under her skirts and say, here, protect us. You know, we, we love you, Uncle Sam. And let, protect us against that Chinese, uh, that, that, that Chinese uh, threatening part. But actually, America might like that, but that's really not what's going to happen. And it's not at all clear that if most of these countries do not want to have to choose. You've heard that before. They don't want to have to choose. Do we belong to China or do we belong to the United States? And if the Chinese are smart and they work very hard at this delicate diplomacy, they will not force that issue with these countries. With these, look at Vietnam. You know. So it, China might look at the United States and say, oh, that awful United States is trying to get all these countries to join with the United States in, in, in resisting us and opposing us. But the Chinese are smarter than that, and they know that they have so much, they have so much, they have so many ways in which they can influence peacefully the attitudes of the countries around their periphery. That uh, that uh, I don't really think we're going to see a kind of a taking sides uh, either with the U.S. or with China. These countries, the little, the smaller countries, will try to play the odds back and forth between the two. And if they did ever do that, if we ever succeeded in persuading everybody to stay on our side and to oppose the Chinese on every issue, we might not succeed. Now, Japan is a different matter. But even in Japan's case, even in Japan's case, you know, one, 30 seconds. I, I translated a book not too long ago uh, by a woman named Zhang Yaowen, um, which is a very interesting, complex book about World War II and and German generals and, uh, and memories of tragedy and the Japanese uh, invasion of Nanjing and Europeans protecting Chinese uh, refugees in Nanjing during World War II and so forth. And the last chapter of the book was this long, long chapter on the Japanese as a people and Japanese culture. It was very, very bitter and highly emotional and and uh, almost racist, it, it was certainly nationalistic. And I, I worked very hard at it. There were lots of things that had to be researched and mistakes and everything else. I killed myself on it. The book finally was published in English. And the publisher sent me two copies because I, you know, I mean, I got paid for the translation. But she sent me two, two souvenir copies. And I opened the book, and the whole last section wasn't there. It was the darndest thing you ever saw. The book just ended. At the end of this section about this Danish guy and this German guy who protected the cement factory in Nanjing and, and sheltered 10,000 Chinese refugees during the, the tragedies of the Japanese occupation of Nanjing. But there was a whole last chapter, which was the author's speculations and reflections about, particularly about Japan, about, the, about how Japan behaved in Manchuria, about how the Japanese fleeing Manchuria after the surrender threw their babies into the river and no Chinese mother would ever do that. I mean, it was this whole long, massive disquisition and suddenly it was gone. I mean, they just put a cover on the front and back of the book and they, it wasn't there. I, what is this? Well, I wrote to the publisher and said, what's happening? She said, the author took it out of the last minute and you know, the author's, the author's got the right to do that, maybe. I detect, again, in this China field, you start thinking, what are the levels? What are the levels? I, my personal view is, and I mean, I had lots of exchanges with this author. She drove me crazy. She, she was so sloppy, and there were so many things to fact check that she couldn't defend and so on. But leaving aside all of that nasty correspondence through an intermediary, of course, leaving aside all of that, my hunch is she pulled it out because by the time the book was ready to come out in English, for an English-speaking audience, China was not, the, the Chinese political powers were no longer in the same place with regard to Japan. They, they, it's not that they will forget what happened in Nanjing, but they were no longer in this, in this deep,
cultivation day by day, putting more salt in the wound about the ways in which Japan was offended and harmed China during World War II. And for that book to come out with that chapter was no longer appropriate. Now, I'll never know. Uh, she'll never tell me. The publisher's never going to tell me. The publisher may not even know. But I still think that, that these, these relationships, the, even the Japan relationship with China, which has been so bitter, nothing is, nothing is, is forever, necessarily. If the, Chi the Chinese are very nimble, surprisingly so for a, Mar for a Leninist, Stalinist regime, but they're nimble. And if it suits their needs to become closer to and warmer with Japan, it could happen. Thank you.